A reading from the book of Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is, woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from the sleep, he did as the, Lord of, as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife and had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus, the Gospel of the Lord. I'm going to tell you to sit down, but you're already sitting. I'd like to invite all the children who are worshiping with us to please come forward at this time, if you would. Now I'm going to sit over here in this chair. You all can turn around and face me, if that's okay. Is that okay? Are you all excited? Huh? Are you all excited for coming up who? Christmas, right? Yeah. Coming of Jesus at Christmas time. I have to tell you a story that happened a long time ago to me. Everybody here knows what a lilac bush is, right? That's what lilacs look like and how they smell. Aren't they beautiful? Sure you do. Well, I have to show you one. Well, one winter, I decided to use a branch off of our lilac bush as a Jesse tree. You're really stubborn, aren't you? A Jesse tree is what we use to get ready for Christmas. A lot of churches encourage people to use a Jesse tree, which means you, you have all these different pieces of paper on the Jesse tree hanging there, and in the paper there's a lesson to be there's a lesson that is there for you to read with your family every night during the season of Advent, which is all usually 25, six, 25 days or maybe a little more. Anyway, we decided to do that. I, I took that, that piece of uh, lilac bush and we had, a, we, had a sand, we had a sand pile in the backyard. And in the backyard, I had some sand still from, from, from the spring and it was a little wet. So I took a coffee can, which you don't see often anymore, a tin can, a coffee can, and I filled it up with that sand, 
And then I took that, pa- that tree and I stuck it inside the sand. And then I hung all those things on the tree. And every day, we as a family would take one off and we'd read it and we'd pray and we'd sing some Christmas songs. Well, guess what happened? On Christmas Eve, literally, on Christmas Eve, we did our last Advent prayer, used the last one off of our tree, and that tree blossomed in the middle of the winter. I had lilacs blossoming in my Folgers can. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? All those days, I thought it was a miracle. And for me, it was a miracle, because it came right on time. But I had some friends tell me, that, that's going to happen all the time. That's just nature. But you know what? I thought it was cool. So that's my Advent message for all of you. I hope, hope you all have a wonderful Christmas, and we'll see most of you on Christmas Eve. So can we take a minute to pray? Please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the season of Advent. Thank you that it's almost over. And Christmas is just around the corner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go quietly back to our places in worship. Well, grace be unto you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Advent. Advent is a season of hope, and it's a season of waiting. You know, when I uh, spoke on the first Sunday of Advent, I asked you, asked how many of you were at good how you were at waiting how good you are at waiting we talked about that i went to asked are you fidgety did you always bring a book with you when you knew you were going to have to wait for a quite a while those are the kinds of things i like to do if i'm standing in line somewhere but i've had a season of waiting about six weeks too long um we are now at a point in that six weeks of waiting that I can actually stand here. God bless doctors and God bless medicine and God bless you for being patient with me. I really do appreciate it. But I am not in any pain. I look like I am. I, I'm very tentative <laughs> because I don't want to cause any. So I'm, I'm being a little bit tentative. And this kind of brings me to our... Um, lesson for today. First of all, I want to tell you a story about Wally, and I'm sure many of you have heard this story before, maybe even went to a play recently. It was called, I think, the most wonderful Christmas pageant ever, and I know that you've heard it because it's old. It's about Wally. Wally is an oversized fourth grader, I believe, and uh, Wally wasn't very good at uh, being where he was supposed to be, and he, uh, he, all the time when he was a little younger, they'd always put him in the Christmas pageant as maybe a shepherd or a tree because he was so big. But uh, this time, they decided that Wally was going to have a spoken part. Wally was going to be the innkeeper because Wally could fill the door of the inn and not let anybody in. So they practiced and everything was just fine. Wally only had one line. There's no room in the inn. That was his line. There is no room in the inn. And Wally practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And finally, when Joseph and and Mary finally came to the door of the inn, they knocked on the door and they told Wally just how really, really tired 
that uh, Mary was, how they'd come so far from, uh, from Nazareth to get to Bethlehem, and they're just really, really, really worn out. So Wally started to say his line, like, there, there, there is, he's supposed to say there's no room in the inn. He says, I'll tell you what, why don't you come on home with me? <laughs> so Wally, Wally understood the whole thing. He knew that Jesus needed to come home with him, with us. Started out, there's no room in the inn. Well, it seemed like there was no room for Jesus anywhere in his lifetime. He, uh, he wasn't welcome even in his hometown. When they tried to, after he spoke for a while, they tried to push him off a cliff. And they couldn't push him off the cliff because something happened that allowed him to walk right through the crowd. But there was no serious applause or they weren't really worried. He just walked away. And he said, you know, there's, there's no glory, no honor for a preacher in his hometown. And that's what uh, we uh, clergy tend to believe sometimes. However, this is my hometown. Well, close. I mean, I'm, I'm in that bedroom community, Cedar Rapids. <laughs> so there's no room, no room for Jesus in his hometown. Even after he uh, raised people from the dead, there was no cheering, no jumping up and down. People in charge of the synagogues, they, uh, they want him out of there. They didn't want competition with him. He wasn't very good for politics. It was just not good for anything in terms of politics because they just didn't agree with him. And if you didn't agree with him, they didn't want you around. So they, uh, there's no room for Jesus in the area of politics. Even in the area of being a physician, you know, he would... Uh, raise people from the dead, give sight back to the blind, enable the uh, lame to walk. But it, uh, it just kind of happened, you know, everybody did that. And so there was no room, no special room for Jesus. The woman caught in adultery, the area of law. The law was, of course, if you're caught in adultery, you're supposed to be stoned to death. Just the woman, you don't mess with a man. Only the women, it's all their fault, and they're the ones that are supposed to be stoned to death by the men because she had been caught in adultery. But when they brought this woman to Jesus, Jesus wouldn't play their legal game. Jesus knelt, wrote something in the sand, and told the men, he who is without sin and throw the first stone. Nobody threw a stone. But yet, they were going to just kind of wait a while. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and Annas and Caiaphas, they were going to get him eventually, but it wasn't time yet because it was such a crowd. Didn't want to do it when there were crowds around. But Jesus just, there was no room. No room for him in the realm of law. No room for him in the area of, of uh, religion any, either because he taught things different than Annas and Caiaphas. They saw him as a threat. They didn't need a third person there in charge. They just wanted to keep their power, keep their control. So there was no room for Jesus. There was no triumvirate, just two, Annas and Caiaphas. There was no room. This is kind of the way it was with Jesus from the time he entered Bethlehem. There was no room for him in the inn. Think about the money changers in the temple. This really hit him in the, in the belly or in the pocketbook. You know, the money changers in the belly, that wasn't in the temple, that wasn't so bad because it was an area where people would come and they would have to, you know, they're there to make an offering in the temple. Well, you can imagine trying to get a, a, a bull to uh, 
move through the rocks and the hills and the trouble with trying to get them to Jerusalem. So what they did <clears throat> was they would go to Jerusalem with money, their money, the money they used every day, and they would then try to buy a chicken or tur turtle doves or a goat or a lamb or even a cow. And they'd use money. But it wasn't the money that they were using in Jerusalem. So they had to have money changers. You know how it is. You go to Europe, you have to have money changers. You have to go to these machines and they'll cheat you. Well, that's what, <laughs> that's what was going on in Jerusalem. That's what was going on in the temple. The people who were doing the money changing were cheating the people who came to make an offering. And Jesus couldn't have that. He couldn't have the temple of God being used to cheat people. It was there to edify. It was there to remind people that they're children of God. And so he turned over the tables, and the money was all over the place, I imagine. But he just didn't fit in with their economy. There was no room for Jesus in that temple. Remember the story of the Gerasene demoniac? It's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. The Gerasenes. Jesus and his disciples got out of their boats and walked into that area and came upon a man that was wild. He was practically naked, probably was naked. He lived among the tombs, which means he lived among the graves. And uh, he was just a wild man. So Jesus met him and he asked him, who are you? He says, my name is Legion. Well, we know that Legion would be a lot of people. It's a military term. There's a lot of people in a, in a legion. And so Jesus uh, told the legion to leave this man and to go into the pigs, the swine. Just too exuberant. Into the swine. And so they did. They ran into the swine, and the swine ran off the cliff and into the, <clears throat> into the lake and drowned. Well, these people were not Jews. And they had a business of raising the swine. So this, again, was Jesus getting in the way of their economy. So they sent some people to Jesus and told him, you got to leave. You got, there was no room for you here in the land of the Gerasenes. Seems like there was never any room for Jesus anywhere. So the question is, um, is there room for Jesus in your life? Is there room for Jesus in your home? Are you like Wally? You don't want to stuff him back in that cave. You would allow him to come home with you, to be at home with you. Is there room for Jesus, the babe in Bethlehem, the man who was hung on a cross so that you and I can have life and have it abundantly. Is there room? Just like Wally. In the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.